All right, let's bring it back. We can close up our sharing and bring it back. I'm sure a lot of you shared many different ages, from the age of reason, like right when you were, you know, when you were able to discover right from wrong, you knew there's that, that tiny white host, there's something different, there's something, there's something incredible there. Um, or it could be um, right now in your life. Um, I was able, privileged to be able to share a mission um, in the Diocese of Grand Island, Nebraska, if you've ever heard of it. It's a state in the country. <laughs> but what was so beautiful is that I asked that same question to the people in, in Nebraska, in Grand Island. Um, beautiful, beautiful diocese. And... Um, the, it was it was a smaller gathering and just asked people to share the, the ages, the numbers. And there was this one man in uh, the back who raised his hand and he said, 91. And it was, it was very powerful for me. I prayed about it a lot because the Lord, he always wants to go deeper with you. And so today, I love how we're, we're calling this encounter, that today you get to encounter the Lord in a deeper way. You're never too old. You're never too young. You're never too holy, you're never too not holy and broken to be able to receive the Lord and go deeper. Um, and so, just to begin, I just want to pray again. And as we pray, I'm going to read um, from Corinthians. And as I'm reading for, from Corinthians, I would invite you to really share your desire for the day with the Lord. The thing is, Jesus places desires on our hearts. And he wants to fulfill those desires. And so whatever you really are wanting from this day, from this encounter, whether it's, I just want to feel loved today. Or it's, I I really want to be convicted about the Eucharist. Or I want to be done with this one sin. Whatever is the desire on your heart, share it with the Lord in this prayer. Because all he wants to do is fulfill the desire that he already placed on your heart. Let's pray. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, Amen. Come, Holy Spirit. Veni Sancti Spiritus. Come, Holy Spirit. For I received from the Lord what I also handed on to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night he was handed over, took bread, and after he had given thanks, broke it, and said, This is my body that is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also the cup after supper saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, You proclaim the death of the Lord until he comes. Lord Jesus, I ask you to be with us, to continue to go deeper into our hearts. Remind us of the intimacy that you want with each and every one of us. I ask you, especially through your most holy name and by the power of your most precious blood, to take away anything that is not from you within our hearts and in this room, that through your most precious blood, by your most holy name, that we may be safe to encounter you this day. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. It is now, it shall be, O Amen. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, Amen. Awesome. Thank you guys. This is amazing. And thank you for saying yes today. I know Florida is an amazing place. You could be doing so many different things, sunbathing, surfing, doing all the things, but you are here because you want the Lord. And this whole, these whole three years of the Eucharistic revival is incredible that the bishops, the USCCB, it's like if you've ever seen Star Wars, like the Senate, it's like that. Like all the bishops, (laughs) they come together and they talk about the issues of the church and they, and the, the beautiful thing is, The thing that they want, that they desire 
for us to receive is a greater conviction and love and devotion for the Eucharist. That is what this revival is all about. And it begins with our own hearts. So it's great that we want to go deeper in conviction with the Lord. And personally, why I think this Eucharistic revival is so important and so beautiful is that I had an experience when I was six years ago, when I was, I was really old, a 28-year-old, when I first got ordained um, a, a priest, I uh, was at a parish in Chicago, my first assignment, and I had this experience where I knew that, <laughs> I knew that we needed a revival. I, I was in my second grade classroom. This, it's still like so vivid. We were getting ready for First Holy Communion for the second graders. And I'm in there just kind of hyping them up Maybe that's not the best thing to do with second graders, but I was hyping them up before going into the church for the, for their first Holy Communion. So excited. And I asked them just a really simple question. All the kids are there. All the parents are there as well in the classroom. And I said, guys, okay, what are you most excited about, about your first Holy Communion? A couple kids raised their hand, but my favorite kid who I chose, um, cute as a button, little boy. Um, he had like his, face was bigger than his body, you know, he hadn't grown into himself yet, and he raised his hand, and I called on him, and he said, we get to eat God. <laughs> and like, as, as a priest, I was like, oh my gosh, you're going to be like a doctor of the church, this is amazing, like, <laughs> this is real, this is so real, like, you, you realize what we are going to do, you are going to consume the Lord, you're going to, you are going to eat God. It's so beautiful. And then um, the mom, who was very embarrassed, her face was really red, came over to him and kind of like hugged him. And she apologized with everyone in the room saying, I- I'm sorry, I- he didn't actually mean that. Like, I, you know, and it's, it really is, that's an, I know that's not what we do. Um, and my heart in that moment, at the heart of a priest, the heart of a father, I just was, it really sank. Because here, this is exactly why there is this need for a Eucharistic revival. Because the reality is, we consume the Lord. We eat God. We want Him that close. The intimacy that Jesus Christ wants with us is that close. And that's why we are here. Um, to reconvict our own hearts so that we can go out, be sent, and to share this incredible news with everyone we meet. Because the Eucharist is the greatest gift that we have as Catholics. And so, yes, amen. (laughs) So the first thing that, basically what I want to share is just three things that the bishops over and over have have shared, like this this desire, the reality of the Eucharist, how we can really grow um, in conviction and just a deepening in our love for the Lord. Um, And basically three things come to mind that what the Eucharist reveals for us. So this first talk is really to get the juices flowing Um, If you are journaling or if you're taking notes and something really strikes you, it may be that the Lord wants you to go deeper throughout this day. Um, So these three things that the Eucharist reveals can help us throughout the day today. And the first is this, that Jesus, the Eucharist reveals that Jesus wants to be close to us. Jesus actually wants to be close to us. God wants to be close to us. We know this with the Incarnation. Um, I've been reading a book that one of my priest buddies suggested, which I never read in seminary, which may be bad, but um, it's a book by Hippolytus called On Apostolic Tradition. It basically, he talks about like the er- early Christianity and what was going on in the early Christian, in the early Roman and Greek, these Roman and Greek empires in the, in the world at the time. And he was sharing that Christians, of course, believed in the incarnation that God wants to be close. But at the time, in these apostolic origins, in early Christianity, Roman Greek religions were still going on. Pagan religions were happening. And for Roman and Greeks, when they wanted to pray to God, when they wanted to actually ask for God's help, they had to go to the God's location. They had to go to where the temple was. So if they wanted to pray if they wanted to get the attention of like the the lightning god they would have to go up high in the sky to the the temples in the mountains they wanted to talk to the river god they would have to go to the river 
they wanted to talk to Poseidon, the, the sea god, they would have to go to the ocean, go to the shore, to the temples there. Um, and it's amazing. Have you ever seen Hercules, the Disney cartoon Hercules? Hercules, what does he have to do? He has to go the distance. He has to, there's a whole montage of him going through fields and climbing mountains to be able to talk to his dad, Zeus. He has to go find his dad. But what is the reality as Christians? Our dad comes to us. He loves us so much that he sent his only son. And not only that, but Jesus Christ, he walks like us, talks like us. He experiences everything but sin. And he wants to be with us. Ascends into heaven, and that's not the end. He actually wants to be close still, so he gives us himself in the Eucharist. That he actually wants to be close to you. We don't have to go anywhere. That he's, he's made himself present in every tab- tabernacle throughout the world. It's incredible. This is, this is the reality of God wanting to be close. Jesus wanting to be close to us. We don't have to go anywhere. One of our students at the Newman Center, where I'm at in Chicago, he made this Instagram post that went viral around campus, for good or for bad, but he took a picture of our tabernacle in our chapel. And he took a picture, he posted it, he put a little like meme kind of caption on it, and it said, Jesus, Jesus' location can be found here. And underneath, he figured out the GPS coordinates of the tabernacle, and he posted it, and people loved it, because Jesus actually has a location. (laughs) Like, you can go to, we can be close to him. So the Eucharist reveals that Jesus wants to be close. It's amazing. And also, like, I noticed yesterday when I was walking around the boardwalk, or whatever it is, um, that there was a guy out there surfing. Um, I didn't, I thought that was a California thing, like, Florida people surf as well, that's cool. Um, but it's this also reality that how do we respond? How do we respond to Jesus being close? I think we respond a lot by being kind of like how a scientist views water and not as how a surfer views water. Scientists views water as like, yeah, I know a lot about water. I know that it is a liquid, a solid, a gas, H2O. There's this amount of water on the world in the world, this percentage. Like, we know a lot about Jesus and the Eucharist. We know a lot about our faith. But we're called to respond in this way by being like a surfer. How does a surfer view water? I want to be one with the water. You know, I want to be, I want the water in myself. I want it close to me. And how do we respond to Jesus wanting to be close to us? We can be close to him. That's why one of the beautiful things about this Eucharistic revival is that uh, it's there's being a push of making frequent visits to the Blessed Sacrament, being close with Him in the Eucharist, daily Mass, bringing your kids, no matter how crazy they are, just to sit in front of the Lord in the Eucharist. So that's the first thing. The Eucharist reveals that Jesus wants to be close. Second thing, Jesus the Eucharist reveals that Jesus actually delights in you. He delights in you. He likes you. I think, I mean, how often do we, when we are in catechism or even at mass or so many different circumstances where we're here, God loves you, which is great. It's a good thing that God loves you. It's an amazing thing, but we hear this all the time. God loves you. God loves you. Jesus loves you. But guess what? He actually likes you. He likes being around you. I was sharing this with our students a couple weeks ago when there was, there was just a lot of, a lot of our students at the Newman Center were experiencing a lot of, a lot of comparison, the things that they didn't like about themselves. Raise your hand if there's something about yourself that you don't like. (laughs) Jesus actually delights in the thing that you don't like about yourself. He delights in you. He delights in everything about you. I just want to share Psalm 139. You may have heard it before. Just a little excerpt from Psalm 139 where it's revealed, yeah, Jesus doesn't just love you. He actually likes you and delights in you. You formed my inmost being. You knit me in my mother's womb. I praise you 
Because I am wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My very self you know. My bones are not hidden from you. When I was being made in secret, fashioned in the depths of the earth, your eyes saw me unformed. In your book all are written down. My days were shaped before one came to be. How precious to me are your designs, O God. How vast the sum of them. He doesn't just, doesn't just love you. He delights in you. And the Eucharist reveals this. My, uh, my new brother-in-law, I had a really great experience with him. So my, my sister, it was almost a year now, um, I had the privilege of marrying my sister past November. Sorry, that sounded weird. <laughs> I had the privilege of celebrating my sister's wedding in November. And what was so beautiful about that moment, um, I mean, it was the happiest day of my life besides my own priesthood ordination. And sitting, standing, you know, at the altar, watching my dad walk my sister down the aisle towards me and my brother-in-law. Um, and seeing my brother-in-law's face was incredible. He had this gaze of love, this look of absolute, like, reverence towards my sister. And as she came in with her beautiful, beautiful white dress, one thing I noticed was, and you may have noticed this before at weddings, um, there was a certain amount of people in the church that didn't look at Claire, didn't look at my sister. They looked at Mark. And you may have done this before, and it was all the women who were already married in the church. <laughs> But it totally makes sense. It absolutely makes sense because here is here are women who have already experienced this gaze of love before and they want to see it again. And they want to see that gaze of love, that gaze of absolute reverence. This, this, this look of I am ready to give myself completely to you. And to be able to see that again is so beautiful. And that is how Jesus looks at us Every time the priest holds up the host, says, this is my body, this is my blood, that's how Jesus is looking at you. He looks with reverence. He's delighting in you. He's absolutely loving you. And when he, when he is held up, behold the Lamb of God. Every time you go to adoration. Isn't it amazing? You don't need to prove anything to the Lord. He's already delighting in you. and He's already loving you. How healing is that? The healing gaze of Jesus Christ within the Eucharist. Wow. Two days ago in the morning, uh, we have the missionaries of charity are right near our Newman Center. Um, and so I'll go over there and help in the crazy early hour that I won't even name um, where they want Mass. And so I'll, I went and celebrated Mass for the missionaries of charity. Beautiful, beautiful sisters. And sometimes uh, a mom or dad, a parent of the missionaries of charity, will visit and they'll stay there and they'll just be with their, their daughter at the, at the convent. And so one of the dads of the sisters was there visiting at the, at the convent. And this, it was so beautiful. This dad, um, you could tell he worked a blue-collar job. He was like in his late 60s, but still like had the build of this blue-collar dude, biceps bigger than my face, and he, you know, like hairy gorilla arms and everything. And he's, we're about to celebrate Mass, and he sits down in the midst of these beautiful little petite missionaries of charity. And his daughter gets up to um, do the reading, to lecture. And so I'm sitting there, and she begins first reading, finishes the first reading, and then she chants... Um, she chants the psalm. And as she's chanting the psalm in a very just simple, beautiful way, I look out and I see all the missionaries, the charity sisters, and then the father sitting right there in the midst of them. And this big, gruff dude, tears started streaming down his face. Watching his daughter just sing, totally delighting in her. Um, and 
the most beautiful moment was that she, as she's chanting, sees her dad and begins like getting a little misty-eyed as well. How healing is it to see the vulnerability and the absolute love and reverence and tears from the Father? Like, if you've ever seen your dad cry, or if you've ever seen someone really close to you be vulnerable like that, it's very healing for our own heart. Every time we go into adoration, what is the Father doing? Because the Son, in union with the Father and the Holy Spirit, when we go to adoration, it's not just Jesus, it's the Father and the Holy Spirit as well. Your dad is delighting in you and looking at you the same way, reverencing you in that same way. How could we not go to adoration after like really realizing that? It's so beautiful. So that's, that's the third thing. Is Second thing, thank you. That's the second thing. <laughs> Sorry. I only had one cup of coffee. The Eucharist reveals that Jesus actually delights in you. Third thing. The Eucharist reveals that Jesus wants to be held. Jesus actually wants to be held by us. When I was at, I went to college at the University of Illinois in Champaign, go Illini. Um, It was an awesome experience where at the beginning of my time there, all I wanted to do is kind of be away from the faith. But I went on a retreat because of a girl. And (laughs) during this retreat, um, I was 17 years old. And 17 years old, that's my age, when I saw Jesus for the first time in the Eucharist. When I recognized him as truly present in the Eucharist. This was the first moment, so 17 years old. And it was after that moment that I began trying to live my faith and trying to, like, trying to realize that, okay, if this is real, if the Eucharist is is real, I have to change my life. And so slowly but surely, I started taking away this kind of double life, living my faith, but also being a crazy college student. Um, So much so that around my junior, senior year, started thinking about the priesthood because I I felt like I couldn't do anything else but be close to Jesus in the Eucharist. One beautiful moment that always stands out to me when it came to just my own vocational journey was when in in the spring we would always have a We'd always have a mass on the grass in the quad area. We called it mass on the grass where we would celebrate mass in the midst of all the students going to and from class as an evangelization opportunity. And focused missionaries were there helping out. Um, I was able to serve the mass and people were explaining to other students what was going on. And so we went through mass, very beautiful. And at the end of mass, we had to bring the leftover Eucharist back to the tabernacle. And so the priest at the time, who was a great source of my own vocation, he turned to me and he said, hey, we need to bring, Jesus, we need to bring our Lord back. So can you come with me? I was like, yeah, of course. So he took the saboria, filled with Jesus, and we walked back to his car. When we got to his car, he turned to me and he said something so simple, but I will never forget it. He said, Tim, will you hold our Lord for me? Tim, will you hold our Lord for me? And so he handed me Jesus. He handed me the Lord. I'm holding him. And all I can hear is like, will you hold our Lord for me? Will you hold our Lord for me? Just not even computing that I'm holding God. We get into the car and we start driving. We're not saying anything because basically we're in adoration in the car. (laughs) And as we're driving, just those words kept reverberating. In my heart, will you hold our Lord for me? Will you hold our Lord for me? And I knew the reality that I would never be satisfied until I held him in the Eucharist as a priest. And so in the moment in the car, as awkward as it may have been, I said yes to the Lord. And I entered into seminary and became a priest. And every Mass, you get to hold the Lord. But the reality is, at every Mass as well, you get to hold the Lord. That God wants to be so vulnerable that you hold him, whether on your tongue, in your hands, that you actually hold him, that he wants to be that close. And so we're going to be able to experience 
holding the Lord. And the next time that you go to Mass, you get to hold Him. And so realize the vulnerability that the Father has, that Jesus has, when He gives Himself completely to be held. That's how close He wants to be with you. So allow yourself to, to hold God. That brings intimacy. Today is an uh, awesome day. It's a memorial of Our Lady of Sorrows, um, it, which is an amazing day to just to, to be close to Mary as well. And I just want to, you got to shout out Mary. you got to shout out Our Lady. Um, and one of the beautiful things about Our Lady of Sorrows is um, the, pro- the prophecy of Simeon where swords, a sword shall pierce your heart. Have you ever seen an image of the Immaculate Heart of Mary, the Sorrowful Heart of Mary? You see those swords piercing your heart. St. Bernard of Clairvaux, awesome, awesome rock star saint, he talked about that when you receive the Eucharist, when you receive the heart of Christ, uh, in, in a bit you may hear about the Eucharist, like Eucharistic miracles and how we actually, when we receive communion, we receive the heart flesh, the heart of Jesus, St. Bernard of Clairvaux also shared that when you receive Jesus in the Eucharist, you're receiving Mary as well. Just imagine that. The heart that was formed in the womb of Mary also contains the DNA, also contains Mary. And so when we receive Jesus, we also receive Mary. And so as we go forth in this day, I just want to ask Our Lady's intercession the Immaculate Heart's intercession. So can we just say a quick Hail Mary before we close? Hail Mary. And so, three things again. The Eucharist reveals that Jesus wants to be Second thing, the Eucharist reveals that Jesus actually delights in you. Yes, he likes you. And the third thing, Jesus wants to be held. Yes. Guys, this is, this is the greatest gift that we have been given, the Eucharist. So we can, you can accept it. You can reject it. But if you do accept it, you are embarking on the greatest love story that the world has, ne- has ever, ever known. And you will never be the same. The Lord be with you. May Almighty God bless you, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Stay close to the Lord today.